I wanted to welcome everybody tonight, uh, this afternoon, and I really appreciate your coming. I know 4 o'clock on a Friday afternoon is an awkward time for many people, and I think through the evening and then through tomorrow, more people will be added to the audience. But thank you for coming uh, at this time. Um, the origin of this symposium really was in a conversation about two years ago between Alexander Heyman, Patrick McCarthy, and uh, Margot Sanchez here at Bonbon. Uh, and me. And at that time, we imagined a speaker series. It was really um, Alexander Heyman's idea that would um, be able to bridge the gap between accomplished people from Bosnia who occupied professional and academic positions and younger people, including uh, younger Bosnian Americans, uh, as a way of inspiring and mentoring. And uh, so we pursued some funding for that, and we got funding from the Fontbon Community Connection, and then additional funding for, from the Human uh, Missouri Humanities Council. But then, once we had that funding in place, Patrick had the inspired idea of just going ahead and having all of the speakers here at the same time, so that we would be able to really have the synergy that would come from the conversations. Um, and, and so that was the origin of this idea. And then the origin of the Bosnia Memory Project, which along with the Bosnia and Herzegovinian American Academy of Arts and Sciences, well, that was really started in 2006. The story is too long to tell here. But I, I just wanted to mention it because we first imagined that as a historical preservation project that would be built around video recording interviews of survivors of the Bosnian genocide. But what I really very quickly came to learn is that, is that preservation really has to be understood in the context of ongoing conversations. Um, and I've been reminded of this so often already, just in the short time we've had to talk about things, that it's ultimately the larger conversation that gives life to things. And that, of course, is always changing. And I think today is an important episode in that ongoing conversation. Um, and really, given that this symposium should be a conversation, um, First of all, I want to say that your voices really ought to be part of this conversation. And the audience here, and the audience that will grow over the next uh, couple of days, the audience here is really turning out to be just an amazing assembly of people. Um, I promised myself that I would not name individuals because if I start naming individuals, there will be too many people to name. The list will be endless and I'll miss somebody. So I'm just not gonna, um, use individual names. It would be a very long list. But among us today are people who provided services when Bosnians first started coming to St. Louis as refugees. And there are teachers in the audience who have taught people who are Bosnian in the public school system. Um, and of course, there are scholars here. And I think most important, there, there, are many pe there are people here who are here solely because they have neighbors and friends who are Bosnians. And uh, there are people here, of course, who were born in Bosnia. Um, also, I want to recognize especially the large number of people we have today from the International Institute. I have such a great respect for that organization. And they were so involved with this community back in the 90s when there were so many things to be done and many times I've expressed my regret that I wasn't also involved then, and I have such respect for the people who were. Uh, but most important, I feel, are the fact that we have so many people today who were born in Bosnia, and we have leaders from the Bosnian community here today. We have younger Bosnian Americans who are emerging as leaders. There are people here today who survived concentration camps. There are people here today who lost immediate family members to the war and to the genocide and who were forced to leave their homes and their country under circumstances that were worse than what any of us could really ever imagine if we weren't there. And I just want to say to those people that in your stories and in your presence here, we, we find inspiration and we have a new opportunity to talk about two key questions what it means to be human and what it means to be part of this very strange world that we live in. Um, we have distinguished presenters and panelists and about them I'm only going to say how profoundly grateful I am that they're here. There's biographical information in your programs and if you haven't gotten a program there's a stack 
just very close to the exit there. Also, all of the individual presenters, all three, will be introduced by younger Bosnian Americans who are emerging as new leaders. And since you've got the biographical information about our main presenters in the program, I've encouraged those people who are introducing them to be a bit personal in their introductions because their stories are so important as well. And their presence here today is a reminder to the rest of us that really, and I'll borrow some words from um, Emila Baturovic and, and her appearance yesterday on KWMU, we're all works in progress. And this is really a conversation that will never come to a conclusion. Um, few uh, practical matters. Bathrooms are located on the east this I know is important. Bathrooms are located on the east side, which is this side of every floor of the building. Water fountains are there too. Uh, at six o'clock today, we'll <clears throat> adjourn and we'll have some Bosnian refreshments. We'll have some pitas and baklava um, but before Alexander Heyman's presentation. Tomorrow, if you're able to come back, and I really hope you are, um, you should feel free to bring your lunch. I wish we could provide lunch for everybody, but we don't have the budget. Um, and if you do, consider staying for a lunchtime screening of just a wonderful documentary called Neither Here Nor There, which was filmed partly here in Missouri and partly in Bosnia, and is about a family, of course, that came to Missouri from Bosnia. It's just a, a wonderful documentary. You're welcome to bring your lunch into this auditorium, regardless of what the signs may say. Um, and uh, I, I'll, just, I'll just say that it is a very emotional film, um, but, but you're welcome to, to bring your lunch to that. Um, also, please, at some point, would you fill out one of the surveys that is in the foyer beside a yellow box and drop it in the yellow box? Our funders especially, but all of us as well, all of us who have put this together, are very interested in getting some feedback on the event. So if you'll do that, we'll be deeply appreciative. It's all anonymous. And um, uh, we're just interested in gathering some responses because we will be doing more of these sorts of programs in the future. Um, I did want to let everybody know that we are running an audio recording for the entirety of this afternoon and this evening and tomorrow. I've turned it on, I've left it up here, and it should be able to pick up the audience as well as the presenters, that's what I've been told. Um, it will be on even during the times that we take breaks. And if you feel so inclined to leave a message for us during those breaks, you can simply come and speak to the podium. And, and, and if, if you feel moved to say anything by, by, way of, by way of information, by way of criticism, by way of witnessing, by way of anything, then we'd love to add your voice to the recording that, that we're making here. Um, again, I just want to say thank you for being here. Your voices are important. We will be seeking to foster conversation. And, and with that, I'd like to invite everyone um, to the front here and uh, turn things over to my good friend Patrick McCarthy and the rest of the presenters. Just to add to Ben's comments of gratitude and appreciation for all of you being here today. And as Ben mentioned, the genesis of this idea coming out of a conversation, and we'd very much like to have that be the spirit of our time together, that we're in dialogue and conversation among those of us who are here on the stage, but really based on your own experiences and perspectives, you all are specialists in terms of your contact and knowledge and experience with the Bosnian community here in St. Louis. We're, we're diving into very large topics this weekend that have deep historical roots and really profound implications for both Bosnia and Herzegovina, but also for St. Louis, where so many Bosnians now live and call home. What the format will be is that we'll each say a few words about ourselves and about the topic. And the topic for this afternoon is the idea of pluralism and recovering pluralism in Bosnia and Herzegovina. 
And in places like St. Louis, where so many Bosnians now are part of our community. I would begin by saying that this question, this issue of pluralism, or how people organize themselves to live together in mutuality and respect, is really the question or the issue that drew me initially to my efforts related to Bosnia and to Bosnians more than 20 years ago. Part of that comes out of this important reality and framework for our discussion. And that is that Bosnia and Herzegovina is the only republic of the former Yugoslavia that is not constituted on the basis of a single dominant ethno-religious group. So that by definition and by history, it, it's a place of many people of many backgrounds and not separate entities in the sense that we thought about in Yugoslavia or that's in some ways part of the reality today, but a, but a common culture, a shared culture. And so we'll talk about that and we'll talk about um, the, how that plays out in terms of a sense of identity. We know about Bosnia and Herzegovina primarily from the war. We know about Yugoslavia, but Bosnia and Herzegovina is actually a much older historical and geopolitical space than Yugoslavia. It dates from at least the 10th century. One, one other thought, and then I'll pass along the microphone to my colleagues here, having to do with the reality of the war that touches on this topic of pluralism and a sense of who Bosnians are now in the aftermath of war. And that is that one of the explicit aims of the aggressors in the war from 1992 to 1995 that brought so many Bosnians here to St. Louis, one of their specific objectives was to separate people was to have people divided in ways that were not natural for Bosnian society, particularly in large cities like Sarajevo where people did have a, a shared life and a common life, and that's one of the things that we'll talk about. I'm gonna set aside some of the other comments that I have in the interest of doing what we've talked about uh, at the outset, and that I hope will be the spirit of our time together, which is that we begin a conversation. So with that, I'd like to uh, turn the microphone over and we'll have people in turn uh, introduce themselves and make a few comments. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Amila Buturovic, and I'm visiting you here from Toronto. Um, I'm a professor of religious studies and humanities um, with specialization in Islamic studies at York University. And I come from a society which is similar to, to of course, the United States, but also very different. It always tries to very hard to define itself against the United States. So I think you participate in the discourse about pluralism and multiculturalism in ways that are vaguely familiar to you, but also different. Um, and which intersect, of course, with all the questions that we have in Bosnia. And um, I do think that um, I very much welcome, first of all, thank you everybody for coming, and I, I mean, very grateful for being invited. But I do think that this, and want to emphasize that this definitely needs to be an open and interactive process. We do need to hear your views, because these are some of the very real questions that we are dealing with with and that we are trying to work through. Um, as a historian, I look at uh, Bosnia's pluralism from a kind of long durée of history, looking at things that may have happened in the past, and then also observing how those things may have changed under the pressure of um, global issues, local issues, and so on and so forth. And I do want to, um, rather than you know, just moving it into some kind of abstract <coughs> sphere and talk about it in, in some abstract historical terms, um, I do want to encourage us to think about 
pluralism in as concrete terms as we possibly can. Because I think that we more or less know what we talk about when we say pluralism, but I'm not sure that we agree on the specifics of it. Um, just like you know, trying to define religion, or which I try to define students, and they, if I had 400 students, they all, there, are, there are 400 different answers. Um, and that in fact, we really, um, we need to, to uh, accommodate those different ideas and in some ways try to weave them into our understanding of what is going on now in Bosnia and how we can move forward. Um, and the other issue is that um, I think that Bosnia has, alas, been stuck in, um, in some rather uh, regressive kind of nationalist uh, frameworks of conversation about pluralism. And I would like to, to think that we can move away from them and find other, um, other ways in which we can include a much more um, civic and civil, uh, as well as, if, if, if you maybe use the word vernacular, different forms of unofficial forms of, of pluralism, in which it's not just about ethnic identity or religious identity, but also other forms of self-identification that we might nurture and want to, to put forward, um, that we can, in fact, encourage people to um, to organize themselves, organize their identity around, around different lines of demarcation or different categories of, of being, whether that is that has to do with, you know, with who they are in terms of their um, you know, religion in terms of their sexual orientation, in terms of their, their professional network, and so on and so forth. So, in some ways, do maybe what you know social networks do on, on, on the internet, and that is give us a chance to be and explore ourselves in ways that are not just tied to nationalist modes of conversation. Thank you. Hi, thanks for coming. I'm uh, Ersan Pushkaeva. I'm an associate professor of psychiatry at the uh, University of Arizona School of Medicine, practicing psychiatrist in Phoenix. And um, I recently wrote a book about my personal experience about uh, one year in six concentration camps in, in Bosnia. So um, anything I talk, uh, I involve emotions. Um, and you know, I try to explain to people, I use emotions to explain, because there's always emotional part to, to everything. A lot of people are um, talking about facts and information, and those can be very painful for, for everybody. So uh, just for start, I want to explain, um, I know you know, but I want to say it publicly, there is a big difference between Bosnian immigrants and Bosnian refugees or any immigrants or refugees. Immigrants are people who somehow decided to, to come to the US or any other country because of economic and political reason. It's not easy still, but a refugee is somebody who was forced to leave the home. And um, I gave a presentation on genocide in Bosnia three days ago in, in Phoenix, it's Kazakh Community College organized by the United States Holocaust Museum. When I, uh, in preparation for, to talk about genocide in Bosnia, I learned that every second person in Bosnia was forced to leave their home home. And I was thinking if I give you a number, like, you know, like two million people, or two million seven hundred, everybody will for, forget, but I'm telling you right now, every other person. And historically, I always remember from, um, from my high school time, uh, it was a time that the biggest punishment for a crime was to expel somebody from the village and, and not to let them be, be buried in their own village. That was the biggest punishment. Like people would ask, can you please uh, kill me in my own village and I can be buried in my, my village with my people. So it is one of the biggest crimes that, uh, that was done against us. So. When we came to the United States, it was, a, as a, it was a place different than the place we came from. We came from the place that people take away belongings from you, including all personal belongings. And then 
you know, to be kind to the place that people give you something. So, in the place that allows us to continue our professional life and personal life. So, when I took to a few friends a couple of days ago, we, we all realized that we are talented people like anybody else. We just need a safe place to prove and to show and to develop. And we don't have that place right now in Bosnia. And uh, it, we have to work to get that place that will provide for younger generation to develop, to graduate good school, to have good jobs. Right now, there is no such place in Bosnia. And my my idea would be that uh, if we can do anything to help from here, to bring back pluralism that we are raised with, that would be the best thing we ever do for um, for Bosnia. So how can we do it? I think that by by talking, by explaining to people, and I have another. I just remember I have another proof of things that I'm talking about. The way how I talk about genocide, it's very direct. And in my book, I use names. I didn't change them. There are names in the book that people will be responsible for war crime, and I didn't change them. The way how I talk, I say what I witnessed, what I saw, and what happened. I don't, I don't try to make it uh, nicer or easier. And if I if I talk in U.S. here, I'm safe. Why? Because I have a good frame. Be safe. If I talk in Boston the way how I talk here about genocide, I'll be dead by now. So again, we have to try to bring Boston to be a safe place for the younger generation, and regardless of uh, what kind of church they go, what kind of beliefs they have, there is the biggest advantage in this world is that we are all that we have all different beliefs. We have different emotions, we look differently, we have different education. That's our the best advantage. And in Bosnia, everything is done to, to destroy that. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Um, I am very happy to be part of this conversation, not only now, but in uh, over a long stretch of my life since I've lived here in the United States, past 21 years, and uh, in the future. Um, I can tell that the reason when you're here, you're interested in all this, this being not just Bosnia and our past lives in Bosnia, but also all the um, experiences and thoughts and ideas generated by what we would call Bosnian experience from genocide and fascism that caused it to uh, contending with various forms of identity, which we all have to uh, contend with, uh, had, content, had to have contend with uh, before we came here. But so we came here in a new environment. Um, this is to say that pluralism or multiculturalism or any number of issues that we're going to talk about here is not just um, it is not just something that pertains to our past or the situation in Bosnia today, but to our lives here as Bosnians and as Americans and also as citizens. Um, just realized I forgot to introduce myself. My name is. Alexander Hamilton, I'm a writer, I live in Chicago. <laughs> um, and I'm prone to run sentences, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, at, least, at least you know how to write. That's right. <laughs> 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 what I, uh, of course, the situation which we are finding ourselves today, that is with many of us are Boston Americans, we um, participate to various degrees, perhaps, in you know, two, several, two societies uh, in which questions of identity and pluralism and political representation are very, very important and they're daily discussed and practiced and daily negotiated. Um, the, the, the reason um, we can, in some ways, it could be, uh, it could have access to a better understanding of many of these processes is the hyphen as it were, that we are, many of us are Bosnian American, so that we have a comparative, situ uh, comparative advantage over someone else because we can watch what is going on in two societies that, is, that might look very, like very, very far apart, 
but at the same time, at least for us, but I think it will be on that, are not. Um, for instance, and we can, I, I hope to talk about this um, further, the difference perhaps that we should talk about between pluralism and multiculturalism. To my mind, and this is a proposition for discussion, pluralism is a, a concept that is reliant upon the notion of individual sovereignty. Um, so that whatever culture or ex uh, historical experience might be in my background, I participate as a sovereign individual in the society and political process. And pluralism guarantees my right to participate in that. In other words, that I do not have to be part of a larger group, say an ethnic group, uh, or a, a, a minority or majority of people, to be uh, imbued with sovereignty to participate. This, as you might know, is not the case in Bosnia, where the sovereign, the carriers of sovereignty, of sovereignty are um, ethnic groups, nations, the three constituted nations in Bosnia, so that to be particip a participant in the political process, you have to pass the test of belonging to one of those constituted um, nations. Now, for many of us, and I will declare myself as a, as a complicated ethnic and otherwise, but also my political leanings are anti-nationalist and to the left, generally speaking. The fact that uh, the sovereignty um, that the sovereignty required for participation in Bosnia and Herzegovina political system is uh, is collective, is a violation of individual rights and you know uh, human rights courts is just war. I would agree with me in that regard if you know about the Sage Vinci uh, case and uh, uh, the judgment that came out of that. For, the, uh, for those who, of you who do not know, um, to Bosnians. Um, um, it's not productive. It was the name of the Finci. Jakob Finci and um, um, they sue the country of uh, the state of, uh, of Bosnia and Herzegovina because they, as not being members of uh, uh, of constituted nations, had an equal access to political process and um, the right to be elected, and therefore their human rights were violated. Am I correct? Yeah. Um, um, so the, the the uh, conflict there, obviously, is between collective and individual rights, between a uh, different level, between a culture that has to be identifiable as collective and then reproduced collectively by people, and the individual practices of, of people who might not comply with all the requirements for their alleged culture. In the United States, of course, we like to think it's multiculturalism, but that often means that cultures are um, and ethnic groups and I'm coming from Chicago, I can tell you that they exist and operate simultaneously, but there's a strict segregation and uh, defined borders between cultures uh, and ethnic groups and so on. Um, we'll talk more about this. I don't want to ramble more than I need to. But to me, I want to point this. This is not just talking about what is going on in Bosnia now and how we can get it to a better place. It is That's very important to me, obviously, more than anything else but it's also about the way we live here now, as Bosnian Americans, but also as Americans. Um, how we identify ourselves, how we organize ourselves in the political process, how we get to change things that we don't like within the political process. Thank you. Hi, my, my name is Rafi Kovacic, and uh, uh, I'm uh, three dots, uh, <laughs> very good question. If I was to declare myself in a way that, that Sasha described, I would say maybe Bosnian New Zealander in terms of citizenship. Uh, but it's very difficult to, to really know where the boundaries are. If I now live in the United States for two years, and I, to be honest, don't know whether I will continue living here or elsewhere, which to me speaks volumes about uh, the confusion in my head about the topic that we are discussing today, pluralism, uh, and, and we touched upon this before uh, coming into this room. Uh, I am not uh, at all sure as to how we would define it in, in respect of, of Bosnia and Herzegovina, especially before the war, because let's not forget we lived within Yugoslavia, which added yet another layer of identity and, and uh, this this oneness uh, that to me uh, did not equate exactly with 
uh, either pluralism or multiculturalism, uh, which uh, in fact was the primary target of uh, uh, of, of uh, the strategy that Patrick was talking about of separation of people, which which actually in fact was an official strategy, uh, uh, especially by, by uh, the Bosnian Serb leadership. But we can talk about that later. What, what, I, what I wanted to talk about and what my work has consisted of now for almost 20 years is to try to understand how this oneness uh, imploded uh, and transformed itself into uh, all the different kinds and degrees of separation that exist today um, along ethnic lines, national lines, and, and all kinds of different uh, identities that, that the conflict has uh, given birth to. My work is in uh, first uh, sort of investigating uh, and working in prosecutions of war crimes, of uh, crimes against humanity and genocide. Uh, first in Bosnia, I worked for the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, for the courts of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and I've been working in the field my entire uh, professional career. And when I started thinking why that is so, uh, why am I not uh, dealing with something that is more positive uh, in terms of what it gives me is this need to understand what happened to us. How was it possible that uh, people who belonged to this oneness, uh, we often repeat in this mantra that uh, tries to describe Bosnia and Herzegovina, how we didn't know who was Croat, who was Serb, uh, how we all lived as one, how we celebrated uh, each other's religious holidays and so on, and all of a sudden, overnight, uh, people who used to be, uh, you know, uh, friends, colleagues, uh, who played football together, worked together, loved together, cried together, became uh, basically executioners uh, to each other. How, how was this possible? In trying to understand this, uh, at least to my mind, I came to realize that we were not special at all. We, we, uh, I don't think that uh, although we would like to present Bosnia as special in the context of former Yugoslavia, uh, being uh, different uh, in, in terms of not being a quote-unquote nation state, uh, that is what was so special about it, the cosmopolitanism that is being elevated as a value in various different areas where people of different backgrounds live, was ordinary to us. And this was the target of, of uh, the uh, sort of genocidal strategy, if you want, because in essence it had very mundane goals. They were territory and control over the territory. And in order to achieve this, uh, people had to be moved. And in order for huge numbers of people to be moved, that, as I was talking about, you had to scare people uh, to the point where they would be willing to leave and, and not come back. And this tactic uh, is not, again, something that we have invented. It's been used before. If you kill a thousand, 50,000 will run and not look back. So in, 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 in uh, this uh, regard, I think when we understand what is in, in the field uh, referred to as underlying causes of violence and uh, how violence was used, uh, then I think we will start to understand how to work uh, to, to, like Sasha said, make things better in Bosnia. Um, uh, without that, I think uh, we constantly are in this circle of trying to uh, somehow imagine ourselves uh, both as belonging to the better past and equating that with the better future. 
when in fact the playing field has been so radically and violently redefined that we have to start anew. Uh, there is one, uh, uh, I don't know whether to call him singer, poet, uh, uh, called Damir Abdic, uh, diplomat from Bosnia, who has one of very, very brutal song uh, about the reality in Bosnia. Uh, and, and calling for uh, forgetting everything that was before, but actually trying to look each other in the eyes on the basis of what happened, mass graves, uh, crime, and people uh, suffering, so that we start getting to know each other again. And I think although scary, although uh, uh, maybe even discouraging in terms of what it will take to, to get Bosnia to a situation where it's not constantly on the brink of new war, at least in our heads, we will have to start from these very grim uh, new realities. Let's, let's stay with that a little bit for the moment and we'll, we'll pass microphones around and then uh, begin to engage with your questions and thoughts. But it, in listening to all of you, I think one of the realities we have is a kind of burden of history. And there are two polar opposite ideas. One that you suggested and others talked about in terms of a socially sophisticated culture where over time people learned ways of living together in a kind of cosmopolitanism developed. And then we have, in terms of perceptions and myths about not just Bosnia and Herzegovina, but the Balkans in general, about age-old ethnic animosities that were bordering on inevitable in terms of the kind of violence and conflict that we saw. So we have, in a sense, two, two radically different, diametrically opposed ideas about the basis historically of the South Slavic cultures. Both can't be true. So how do we begin to reckon in terms of what actually occurred with an eye, with an eye toward the future and creating what I think we all agree is a goal of that, that first idea about developing pluralism to mean creating structures where human beings live together with respect <coughs> for differences in a process of interdependence and of mutuality. And so whoever would like to, yeah, yes, sir, please. Yeah. Um, it, it is complicated, but um, Albert Einstein said once, if you are not able to simplify um, something, you probably don't know about it. So I'll try, I'll try to simplify. <laughs> and I have a proof. I can do it. I can. I cannot write about it, but I cannot talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to simplify it. I, and I have a proof. I have a theory that I'm again as a, as a, as a, and I'm going to talk to you as a psychiatrist. Is this? If you have any human being. Uh, a, uh, have a frame to, to be able to do things like animal, like any other, other animal, they'll do it. They'll do it anywhere, in any culture, in any part of the world. We are not any difference. We are the same people here or in Bosnia. And I have a proof for this. In the time for when Tito had the, the, the legal system that was, uh, uh, has a sample legal system, people didn't kill each other. In my big region, we didn't have murder for 40 years. Nobody killed anybody. So in in United States, we have a frame. And we have a, a system, the legal system that protects each other. In Bosnia, we didn't have international community, United Nation allowed killing us. They uh, acknowledged us as a country. And then they acknowledged Srebrenica as a safe zone. Our people came the very back ones. Uh, that uh, Mladic came, kicked out EU and Batalon, and they killed 8,000 people over five or six days. So every 
human being unfortunately has uh, some ill in it. Like our famous writer Mesham somewhere said, uh, the evil is so close to human heart. To do good, you have to put some effort in. And if we have a good uh, environment and good legal system, we will have pluralism without anybody else help. In the national community, not only they didn't help us, they made the state that never existed before in the world. They have millions of, of governments, local governments, and this state is made to not to function. That's what's happening. But again, we have two things to talk. We have to talk about that part. It really doesn't look good. But we have to, we have to also think about our young people here in the US. How to uh, give them some direction, how to help them understand what happened there and stuff like that. So it's a big, big talk, but I wanted to point these things. We are not different than anybody else. Here it is. Okay. I agree with um, Esther that I, within a particular, um, in a stable society that governed by laws and um, culturally acceptable habits and customs, that is, it is written easier to operate as a responsible, moral, and ethically governed human being. The moment when there's a societal breakdown, um, and any of the people who were prior to the moment of societal rupture um, with operate as responsible citizens could turn to um, something else. And any, every single one of us has a story about a good neighbor or a responsible teacher who suddenly um, turned to be turned out to be a, a war criminal. Um, this is why you know restoration of basic um, societal infrastructure is essential to and maintenance thereafter. It's essential to well, moral development of the people and society. Um, of any country. But there's also something, and um, I, I, I would have been as critical of former Yugoslavia in many ways as, as any number of other people, but I also know, remember some things that were good, and it wasn't just vacationing every summer on the coast. Um, one of the things that I did not like all that much before, but I like the idea now, is it was, imp it was possible to imagine a future. There was, there was a kind of utopian project. However, bent out of shape it became, but there was this project of socialism and a better life together. There was something to strive toward. The past was less important, and then you know, some people would say it came to haunt us, but there was a common project, right? And for this common project, uh, people uh, sacrificed something. They put in some efforts. My parents went to these voluntary work actions. They built the roads that they drove on um, and, uh, 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 some years later. Um, they could claim this. What is missing in, in, in the United States, obviously, and it's cheap in many ways here too, is that what all the politicians sell us, from the president all the way down, is um, a possibility of improvement of this country in this situation. There is, they in, invite us and insist that we take part, with various degrees of sincerity, uh, to be take part in this common project we uh, might call America, right? Obama talks about every week. Uh, what is lacking in Bosnia is this sense of, of common project. The nationalists talk in terms of survival and, uh, and survival in, these, in the present political circumstances. How to stay where they are now and how to protect our people from those people. And we know how, what those people are like. I was traveling around Bosnia two or three years ago just before the municipal elections in Bosnia. I mean, it was, it was Herzegovina, in fact. Um, and there were these uh, uh, billboards with uh, 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 election slogans from HDZ, Croatian Democratic Association. And uh, the slogans were, I remember two, Sačuvajmo uh, Vajmo Postignuto, let's keep what we have accomplished, i ne dajmo svoje. This was, this was the political problem. And, and they were no different than any of those other uh, nationalist political parties. The, the program was to, you know, keep it as it is, essentially. Um, because, and not just to keep it as it is because status quo works for them, but to protect it from those others. So there was no, they, they would not even make a gesture, as politicians in this country do, towards some sort of future. 
that if you elect us, we'll do this, and then it will be better. And then your children, whoever you are, will have what you don't have. That has essentially vanished from Bosnia and Bolivar discourse. There's a constant uh, perpetuation of a sense of crisis, and there's, of course, a constant crisis on top of it. And there's a uh, um, going through the past, sorting out, um, on the one hand, sorting out what happened, but on the other hand, uh, not creating a better future, but a better past, that uh, uh, Refi, Refi's phrase from an earlier conversation. They created, so that in Republika Srpska, for instance, uh, it allowed, Dodik and people close to him, they, and this is paraphrasing Refi, I shouldn't be doing this, but I like the thought, so I'll claim it. <laughs> this, is what, this is what fiction writers do, just every idea is my idea. <laughs> Uh, that they, you know, can imagine themselves as victims in the past war, and also at least not as um, not more guilty than anyone else. I'll stop here and uh, let the intelligent man speak. How about oh. intelligent? Intelligent. <laughs> Only because I stole his idea. Uh, I'll steal your idea. And then... You see, my task is double forward. <laughs> And not easy. Um, I think that it's also important to bring in another component, and, and uh, this is a little bit in response to Refik was talking about, and also what Patrick brought about um, the question about historical complexity of Bosnia. That is absolutely true, and we need to really uh, acknowledge that Bosnia has never been a singular society in terms of singular identity. As, as far as long as Bosnia existed, this had some kind of form of pluralism woven into its fabric. Um, but that doesn't mean that it was self-made in that regard. And I think what, what Bosnia what Bosnia uh, lacks is not pluralism. It lacks the idea as to how to manage its own pluralism. And um, you know, in, in, in the age of the empire, we were under the Ottomans for, for 500 years. The Ottomans did it for us, and they managed people in a way that was imperially uh, good for them. It was good for us in some ways. It was also bad for us in, in many other ways. But they were the ones who managed it. Um, Yugoslav the the, the uh, Habsburg managed it, managed it for us as well, and the Yugoslavia managed it for us. And this this is really the first time that Bosnia is given some kind of semblance of opportunity to do it on its own. Um, and we know that this is not in real terms true because the data already set uh, a very kind of global, uh, international presence in Bosnia in a way that really ties uh, many hands down. But um, the conversation, the political conscience and the, the, the whole political language around pluralism is, has completely not come of age. I mean, it's not there. It's not sophisticated. It's not, uh, it doesn't know how, what to do with itself. And I've heard so many times in Bosnia answers, well, we can't wait for European Union to come and do it for us. So I think education is a huge, uh, uh, something that is not so much the experience of, of pluralism, but the understanding of pluralism and the education around pluralism is what is amiss sorrow in Bosnia. And I think that's something that we need to perhaps export uh, based on uh, the models that we have encountered, where people actually do understand self-determination in, in very real terms rather than just in some abstract terms. Uh, I, I will just, uh, on, on, on the back of Assad's mantra to simplify, I will offer uh, uh, two, two thoughts uh, as to Patrick's question. First, uh, I think basically what we are dealing with uh, uh, in this age of rights-based societies, uh, a situation where uh, the, the violence, uh, of course, was used to completely redraw the concept of community and who has rights and who, 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 uh, whose rights are somehow inherent and uh, all the others outside. And we, we see that under the current uh, system, 
which basically uh, comes out of a peace agreement, uh, which uh, many tell me uh, was designed to stop the cannons from spewing death and could never be uh, seen as a sort of a constitutional model. We basically have a situation where that reality has been transplanted into something that is supposed to uh, be uh, a model for a rights-based society. It's simply impossible. We see this. Uh, what, what Sasha was talking about, Sage and Finzi, uh, decision of the uh, European Court of Human Rights. Basically, if you are Jewish, like Jakob Finzi is, or Roma, as Dervo Sejic is, you cannot be a president of Bosnia and Herzegovina. You cannot. Simply, as ludicrous as that sounds, in a country that is aspiring to become a member of the EU, these people are excluded from the possibility of being voted to the highest office. And one of the conditions for Bosnia to be able to even start negotiating with the EU about the accession is for the laws to be changed so that they can be voted in. And the current political leadership cannot agree to do this. So they cannot agree to have a, a society which the basic right of being able to be elected is guaranteed. And then there is a plethora of other rights that are basically not recognized. In the city that I come from, Prijedor, more than 3,000 people have been killed of non-Serb ethnicity, Bosnian Muslims and Bosnian Croats. Today, not 20 years ago, today the mayor is refusing to allow that, that their death is marked in any way by a public monument in the city where uh, they've been killed. They are not uh, at all mentioned in any of the city's official sort of uh, narratives about what happened, as if they did not exist. And this is uh, something that is being denied actively by the same people who are saying, we are for Europe, we are for human rights, we are for uh, progress, and so on. And, and this discrepancy comes from this fact that basically <coughs> the notion of who is entitled to rights has been redrawn. Why are they unwilling to let go? Why are they constantly perpetuating the crisis, and why what is, in my uh, opinion, the most important thing in Bosnia is actually taking uh, the fear out of people, because uh, the fear is the main generating factor for their ability to impose the crisis. Again, to simplify, because parallel with the post-conflict transition, we have the economic transition from a socialist model where everything belonged to everyone, to the state, to capitalism where everything belongs to someone. And uh, in this process, the, the current uh, political establishment, which is the same political establishment for the last 20 years, would not give up an ounce of power over who will end up owning all this. And, and the answer lies therein. Basically, they will not give up uh, until the last dime is privatized, in my opinion. And they are using the traumas of the past, they are <coughs> using the, the fear that is still so present to erect these huge smoke screens uh, for people who live uh, believing that these are the most important issues when, in fact, the most important issues are where the money will go. Okay, so we've set the stage. And those of you who are old enough to remember a guy named Phil Donahue who used to run up and down. You look I'm not going to try to I'm Irish and I do have gray hair, so in that sense we're the same. And in the former Yugoslavia, there used to be, you would take a baton, and if you were a young pioneer, and there was a, a kind of 
relay race that ended up, you would, in honor of Tito, you would carry this baton and it would end up in Belgrade and there was a museum of them. So this is going to be the symbolic baton that you'll have. When you ask a question, you'll have the floor. We ask that you not dominate. But who would like to begin? We've kind of set the stage in terms of key ideas or certain uh, topics to get things started. When I sat down, and I, I have a few friends in St. Louis who are Bosnian. I'm not Bosnian, obviously, I think. I'm actually Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> From Toronto. <laughs> and I was trying to form in my mind how the history of your state or your homeland, however you call it, might be. So I'm going through the centuries. The 20th century was a disaster, especially in Europe. And then you go back into the uh, 19th century. It wasn't much better. And I was trying to say to myself, these people must have had a beautiful time sometime. And I was hoping that you could give me a sketch of when, when the good times were. Because they certainly weren't recently. It was one Tuesday, 1970. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was thinking it was for two or three weeks during those Winter Olympics. <laughs> so could you try to sketch some of the good times? Well, I think the good times depends on uh, where you were in your life. I, I mean, but I think that the times between World War II and, and the beginning of the war were good in that, that there was a sense of um, common project and advancement. In, and, and I was a teenager and I thought I had no future. But now I remember that I actually, when I was angry about things, that I could think of the ways to change those things. And that I could recognize, this was in the 80s, when Tito died and I was you know, a teenager. And I could think of other people and find other places and, and rock and roll bands and whatnot who were you know, involved in the same project. To me, the most important thing for any kind of civic engagement is let's define a common project. And a nation is not a common project. It's at least, you know, at best, something that you just are born into. Um, what is it that you want from a society? What kind of world or state or city you want to live in? How do you want to imagine yourself as a, as a human being? There was, there was a period and, um, before this war I remember it, and I, I think people who are older than me could also remember it. Well, that, that was negotiable. It wasn't perfect. It was difficult for many people. It was unstable, but it was negotiable. It was possible to imagine a better future. And that was struck down after with the beginning of the war. And now uh, the reason why they cannot, I think, allow for genocide to be remembered, because in some ways, well, not remember, but marked, if you had public um, uh, events, uh, uh, public acknowledgement, then it would not stay as long as it does. You could move beyond it. But the idea of not moving beyond it allows everyone to focus on the past. And this is a tact not just a you know ideological thing, but it's a tactical thing. If you think about the past, you, you do not spend time imagining the future, and you pay less attention to the present in which they're stealing enormous amounts of money thereby foreclosing the future for a lot of people. Can I, yeah, I just want to clarify a few things. I'll give you two, two information, and you can, you can put them wherever you want. The first one is after World War II, there was, the UN was formed, and they had a role in the world. They lost that role uh, sometimes in the 80s completely. They didn't reorganize and they are responsible for what's happening in Bosnia and what's happening in some other countries right now. The, in 1950, in Rome, that was a big session of the UN, and they made uh, 50 articles uh, as a law, international law, and I can tell them the first 10 of them, they failed all of them in Bosnia. First one is to have a right for life. I didn't have a right for life. I didn't, and my family members are killed. Uh, right for freedom. I was in concentration camps. I was a physician, practicing physician one day, and next day I was on front line in my gym shoes. Uh, right for private property. I got my home back in 2001. 
and war was over in 1995. A right for education, I didn't have, my kids didn't have. A right for, uh, for war, for anything else. They fail and everything. They have to make major reconstruction, what they do. And then secondly, they put us in the position, I'll tell you what position we are right now. Sometimes in 1995, in the city of Tuzla, the Tuzla is a fairly good size of the city, uh, university. Um, city, a war was not in Tuzla, never. It was safe because it was done, uh, run by Bastian people and Bastian army. There was no war activity in Tuzla. And you, U.S. Uh, bombed some positions as position in East Bosnia in retaliation. They, they sent huge grenades and killed 71 person, age of 14 to 20. The youngest one was two year old. With no warning, no reason, no war activity. If you are killed in the front line, you know, it's kind of almost like understandable in the war terminology, but those are civilian killed. Todik, a president of the Republic of Subscribe now, he said the Bosnian Authority brought dead bodies to the city of Tuzla to show serves they are not good people. That's what he said. And those uh, parents of those kids, they, they tried to sue him, but it didn't go anywhere. So we live in a situation that international, international community, yes, they are, we have to be able to say that anybody, regardless of ethnic uh, belonging, can be voted for to be a president. Yeah, but what is obligation of European Union to us? They didn't give us right to leave. That's what we need to talk and say it openly, without anger. I'm not angry at people who help me in concentration camps. Why should I be angry? I'm a nice human being. I'm a winner of this. I, I um, am able to, to do my job right now, help other people. I'm, I'm a normal person right now. But those people are not normal. I am very normal. And when I say that, right, Patrick, I am normal. I'm not. <laughs> when I say that. So, we have to talk in that frame. The European Union failed us badly, badly. And now they're expecting from us to do something that, that, that they have expectation on us. I think we have to be fair to that situation. They put on this very bad situation. But that's not the end of the world. We are here to talk about it, to help young, younger generation to understand it, to raise them. I, raised, I have two boys, both, both college boys, one graduate, one is almost. I raise them in a, in, a, uh, in a way that don't hate anybody, to love everybody, and the, our, the, again, one more time, the biggest advantage as a human being is to live with people who have different beliefs and, and education and whatever, the color of the skin or anything else. That's what we need to raise our kids in <coughs> the system, regardless of animals like Todik, Karadzic, Milosevic, or others. I told Asa, when he says you're crazy, then you know you're really crazy. <laughs> but I think one of the things, and Rafi, please go ahead, but we have these very abstract ideals that we make a commitment to, and when we fail to enact the action that is required to uphold those commitments, this is the human cost. This is the human consequence of our failure to do that. And we, we have a special obligation in St. Louis, I think, to understand that. Not just because of so many people who came as refugees as a direct consequence of our failure in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but because St. Louis is a place that has so many people who come from conflict situations. So in a sense, to understand that is to understand ourselves and our community. I think uh, just to... to, to uh respond to your question, which I think is a very important question. What were the good times? Uh, especially in context of what I think is the key uh, that Sasha was talking about, and that is the ability to imagine a better better future, because that, that is uh, what drives progress. Uh, first, uh, you would always have to look uh, at uh, sort of what were the good times in the context of what? Like what were the good times for Bosnia, for instance, which enjoyed relative peace during the 100 war? 
100 year war. <laughs> Uh, this myth that we constantly are killing each other. I mean, if transplanted against the relationship between French and German peoples uh, would seem as a long, peaceful existence, coexistence. So uh, if you were to ask me what were the good times, the years before the war were the best times that I can imagine, not only in the context of best times <coughs> in Bosnia, but I now have lived in New Zealand, in the Netherlands, in, the, in Indonesia, in the United States. We had a damn good time. <laughs> and it was, it, it was exactly born out of uh, the, the, the richness of the differences we were enjoying uh, without really knowing that, that they were differences. And again, I'm not I idealizing. Let's, uh, and, and, and I'm sure that, that people here can talk to that uh, with more authority, but in certain areas, especially in rural areas, we had separation. We had different communities living in relatively ethnically pure environments where there were still narratives of the past going beyond Second World War and what we uh, now see as uh, recurring things, sort of people being re called Turks and Vlachs and Shokhtsi, sort of in direct derogatory ways. But uh, then again, this was by no means the primary discourse. The, the situation we have now, after the, the ethnic cleansing, which was supposed to give this happiness of living among your own you know, not being threatened by these dirty others, is that with this new reality, this beautiful, ethnically pure reality, more than 70% of young want to leave. I never wanted to leave, Priedo, never. I never imagined myself living in New York, speaking to you today, you know, seeing New Zealand. I imagined growing old, you know, on the banks of the Sana River with my friends letting my stomach get bigger while we play Bella and, you know, possibly coaching a, a high school basketball team. These were my goals in life. So when you, when you, when you think about that, then you can see that we had a damn good time. Who's next? Who, who would like to ask a question? Sure. As my friend Esther Poshkai said that he is normal, I would admit to him as a doctor that I am not normal. <laughs> so I need a medicine doctor from you. So why I need the medicine is because before war I used to be an uh, officer in the uh, Yugoslavia military in Air Force. Two decades I was teached and I never knew that I am Muslim. I never knew that my sergeant, who is Ravko Janko Marko Mujo Aliada, who was of the region, growing up under that environment for decades, and came to the war, and as you know, I was in Sarajevo all the time during the war, when I realized that I am Muslim, and that enemy side would like to kill me just because of my name. And I came to the United States and I became what I became over here in an environment without nationalism that I grew up. I mean, that I grew, uh, was following up during the war. What happened, why I'm sick, why I'm not normal, is that as soon as I land in Sarajevo airport, first view goes to the tag on the name of the, on the board, who is front of me, so I'm not normal. As soon as I land to Chicago, coming back to my home in St. Louis or in the United States, I start to love the African-American, Chinese, whoever wait for me over there. So just tell me, please, am I normal? That environment, what made from me, so give me some advice and medicine. What's going on? I, I don't even understand myself today. I have to explain this, so yes, you are normal. The situation they put you was not normal. You are very normal. Your every reaction is very normal, but the situation we are put in was not normal. 
Like, you are not the only one who didn't know, and did, you did know what kind of group you belong, but that was not important. That's the key. We have to know who we are, but that's not important. That's not major in our life. I, I had a guy with me in the camp. His name was Salah. And uh, he didn't know. He didn't have a clue. He was like, he was supposed to be a Muslim, right? But he didn't know that he is Muslim. But he's in concentration camp at me, and we are playing like card they made from, you know, Yadro caps and stuff. So, yeah, we play the card. And then he's, we are playing cards, and he's talking to himself. He said to professor, uh, my chemistry professor who is next to me, he said, Professor, what do you think if those, um, he said, who's the shit? They're, they are, they're gonna catch, catch some professor and they're gonna exchange you. And then professor said, maybe. And then there was another guy, a mechanic, and he said, what do you think if they get a mechanic, a Croatian guy, are they going to exchange you? And then he asked me as a doctor, what do you think? And then I said, maybe. And he said, what do you think was any Croat uh, putting dynamite in the river so they can exchange me. <laughs> so he was arrested on the day, he was put in concentration camp on the day when he put some dynamite in the river to kill some fish, and he was thinking he's in concentration camp because of that. <laughs> he, he didn't know that he's in concentration camp because they want, this is the key, they wanted you to belong to other group. If you are other, you are evil. If you are evil, we should kill evil. So they evilize you as a group to, to have a proof uh, to own people to do it. So back to the question, we are all normal, and we are, um, but we are placed in situation that we are really abnormal. Still no medicine. <laughs> alcohol, alcohol. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> not, not better than alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, uh, my name's Anne. Um, I, I promise you there is a question in here, but I need to give some context before I get to the question. Um, the time was spring of 1992, uh, about the time that we started hearing the stories coming out of, out of the whole Yugoslavia. I just happened to be working uh, at a video shoot that night with a gentleman who I'd never worked with before. I knew him vaguely because of other projects. Um, he was Serbian-American. And me just making probably mindless conversation over lunch said, well, tell me what's going on over there. And it's so stark to me. The, there was a profound look of shame on his face or he knew why it was there. Can you give me any insight on that? Um, I don't know, but you know, you'd like to imagine it was a shame of what was happening that he felt responsible for, you know, um, what the people he might have been related to were doing. But it's also simply, that, uh, this is a, a situation with many refugees and refugees and immigrants, it's the shame of being marked by some distant tragedy and therefore becoming exotic overnight. I, I experienced that. And then I had to explain myself to everyone. They, and people wanted me to explain what is going on there in two sentences of, or less at a dinner party. They did not want me to get into, or so I assumed, and this is where the uh, you know, look of shame. Uh, it is someone, like someone asking you, we know you're sick. What exactly is your sickness? But do not bother us too much with that, right? Just tell us if we can do anything. If we can't, well, then we should get out of here because you're supporting the party. This, of course, I don't think that way anymore, but um, there was a time when I, I, I would tell people, ask me where you're from, and say Luxembourg. Because I, <laughs> I cannot explain to you the whole thing. I know what the next question is, and you know, people are yeah. still confusing Czechoslovakia with Slavo. I was saying Luxembourg. <laughs> Everyone has heard of Luxembourg, but no one knows where it is. <laughs> So you know, I would avoid it. So I have no idea what 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 that was. I'm sure you have your own ideas and experiences. Anyone want to add? No. Okay. Who's next? Yes, I, I hear you saying that um, um, the subject of genocide apparently can't be discussed even today. 
openly. And uh, will, will there ever be a chance for reconciliation or a new identity without dealing with uh, openly with the, the genocide? Some kind of reconciliation process that's honest. The process uh, requires a few steps before that, and one of them is justice. And the international community, I have to say, not, we are not the most happy with uh, the, the, the pace of the justice court. But they are doing things. I mean, think about you know, Slobodan Milosevic, who really started this in, in 1987. Uh, he died in the, in, in, in the cell, in the prison. And that's some, some step in the reconciliation. Uh, Radovan Karic, who was uh, an unfortunate psychiatrist, he was the leader of Bosnia and Serb, he's in the cell right now when we are talking. He is in the cell in the prison in Hague. And then he's made General Radko Mladic responsible for Sorenza killing him. So there are many people. Uh, recently, one guy from Sarajevo, from Grbavica, he was one of Batko. He, was, he got 42, year, 42 years or something. So justice first, justice first. Then say after justice, and I'm, I'm talking, that we don't have the model, I don't have the answer. I'm just telling you what happened after World War II. That was a very important process in Nuremberg, process when people got in, in justice system. Very important. Without that, there is no reconciliation without justice. And so first uh, justice, then the process of, of uh, recognizing there was a genocide. Again, the, um, Dodik, who is in power right now, he said that those people brought that body of own children to show that the uh, stage genocide. So they have to accept that they did. They have to accept it publicly, and then they have to be talking about it often. You cannot hide. You cannot hide. And then again, one quote from Desmond Tutu, I'll tell you. He said, if you play ignorant, like if you play like neutral, neutral, you are the same as you are doing it if you are not doing something. So all of us, I'm calling for action. All of us, we can do, I believe we can do something about this. We have to talk, they have to admit they did what they did. And then there is going to be a process of public reconciliation, and it will be. If I can just add to this, the irony here is that, you know, the, the people are in court and being tried, but their projects live on. Their projects are, you know, very successful they have achieved on the ground the kind of separation and the kind of division of Bosnia that they have actually set out to do. So they have been rewarded in real terms for the territory that they can, where they can exercise the kind of nationalist purity where they, in which they can do whatever they want, including denying the genocide for as long as, as, as that, that territory goes on. So that's, this, that's a serious sore point in the whole process of, of implementing justice. Um, and, you know, of course, you know, history is always written by, by uh, first and foremost, by victors. But in this situation, we have everybody is a victor and everybody is a, is a victim, all of, victim all of a sudden. So you have multiple, if we are talking about plurality, we are talking about plurality now of, of victories, and plurality of memories, and plurality of, of victimhoods, and so on and so forth. And that's a very uh, unhappy situation. If I can add to this, since this is actually what I do for a living, um, and, and I would offer several thoughts that may be different to what, what was said before. First of all, the concept of reconciliation is in itself problematic, uh, because the concept of reconciliation is somehow understood to uh, either mean going back to what we had, the sort of national or inter-ethnic harmony, or the, what, what is more rooted in the religious concept of reconciliation, and that is the forgiveness, uh, sort of the purity of, of being forgiven and absolved. Um, in this context, when we talk about justice in terms of justice measures that are being uh, exercise to punish perpetrators of war crimes. Bosnia is without comparison 
the most advanced country in the world at the moment because it is not only about some 100 people in The Hague that have been put on trial for crimes in Bosnia and those of very senior uh, stature. We have a court that has already convicted 185 people, which is the largest number anywhere in Cambodia, where almost 3 million people were killed. You have something like 18 people put on trial. Guatemala, you, you have a trial right now, first, uh, after genocide that was committed there. And then uh, Sierra Leone, 300,000 dead, 16 people convicted. So in terms of uh, the numbers, uh, we have done a lot. But the problem is that genocide that was committed <coughs> was uh, somehow integrated into the political discourse as the all defining value on all the different uh, sides for the fact that genocide was used as a political tool of uh, the, the so-called so nation building of what is today Republika Srpska. And uh, we have this problem of uh, inability to disentangle the two, and that is the justice that needs to be exercise towards individuals and like Amila was talking about the project uh, we have constant back and forth between Serb and Bosnian representatives uh, in terms of Republika Srpska was found, founded uh, on genocide therefore it is illegitimate and should not exist while on the other uh, side you have there was never a genocide was never uh, committed and Republika Srpska came into being as a result of the political will of Serbian people. And while you have that as the heart of the political discourse, this reconciliation that we are talking about is simply impossible. It is impossible. And uh, the, the, there are all kinds of different things that, that are born out of this, the sort of identity defining myths and issues uh, that we will talk about. Uh, tomorrow, but in my opinion, when, when we talk about reconciliation, it is about building state institutions which will a do away with discrimination that resulted from genocide, and b guarantee rights every to everyone on the whole territory of Bosnia and Herzegovina. When we have that, I think what we regard as reconciliation, and that is the ability of people to trust each other again, uh, to talk to each other, that will happen naturally. Because it's happening even today, despite it all. So uh, imagine if the situation was different, if, if people were actually allowed to exercise this humanity, basic humanity. <coughs> Let me tell you a story. Um, there was a woman who was, she, she was like a grandmother to me, it's a long story, but I consider her to be my grandmother, and she grew up in central Bosnia, she was Catholic. She never referred to herself as Croatian, always Catholic, and everyone else was Muslim, Orthodox, they were all Bosnian. Anyway, she was, she was there, uh, a, a young uh, a woman in the time of World War II, and uh, where uh, that part of Bosnia, Zahavid, she was controlled by the, the Croatian fascist Tustas, and they all, Required or demanded that all the you know Croatian youth go join the Ustasha youth, and her father refused to have anything to do with that, and she did not go, and he was opposed to all that. So at some point, the Ustasha took him um, to kill him. They would take him to the river, tie his hands on the back, and they were going to cut his throat. It was a common operational method, and throw him to the river. But he, before it was in January, before he uh, his throat was slit, he jumped into the river and escaped and survived the war. And so after the war, he owned a little shop by the market there. His daughter, my grandmother, would take him food, I know, at lunch, bring him lunch. And one day he was sitting there drinking coffee with some guy, and in the bars are drinking coffee together, it's just one step short of having sex with really. <laughs> <laughs> So you don't drink coffee, that's, that's major, you know, anything. And so, and so drinking coffee, and, uh, and um, he asked his daughter, he says, do you know who this is? And she said, yes, I do. 
there was the guy who was taking the river to slit his throat. And so, you know, it's a shocking story to me. I said, so what did he say with this guy? He said, he said nothing. He said, he just, he just did this. <laughs> and yeah, we got, what can we do? <laughs> and uh, it's horrible, the story is it's also encouraging because it speaks to what Esa was saying, it confirms what Esa was saying, that under, uh, a, when a, a, a stable social order is ruptured and destroyed, there's a moral break, breakdown all over. There are some people who are, you know, the leadership, they organize it from the beginning. There's no moral shift in them. They have the same plan or wrong. But those are, that's a minority. This is what, you know, the cliche word for this, the extremists. But everyone else, right, can be a perfectly nice neighbor and student and decent human being, and then there's a breakdown, and then they kill killers, right? And of course, there's a legal responsibility to that, and that is justice. But many of those people, they did not slit throats, right? They did not run concentration camps, but they were complicit. And I can imagine a situation in which, you know, the social order is restored and this guy says, oh, well, I have to be a nice neighbor again. We have, you know, I have to live a different life now. There are circumstances that allow me to be killed over. They might even feel guilty. They might even find themselves in a society, in a culture that would make them reconsider their um, acts in that particular set of circumstances and commit to never doing them again. For this, you need state institutions, you need education, you need a stable social order, you need guaranteed individual rights, you need individual sovereignty, all of these things that we are talking about. So justice is part of it. It has to be for its public value, but also for um, the sake of restoring the, the uh, um, impartiality um, um, of the legal system. And to me, that in, for this to be possible, that this work of restoring a common project of common life in a stable set of circumstances, there has to be some idea. What is it that we want from a society? <coughs> if all that you want from society is some party, some entity who will uh, guard your nation from those others, that is not a society. That is what you have in Bosnia now. That's how the constitution works, how society works. We will protect you from those others. We will preserve what we have achieved and we'll steal all the money you'll ever have from you, but we'll preserve you. But there's no future projected for anyone. If I can just add one very short thing. The, the myth about uh, Nuremberg trials in Germany uh, and reconciliation, it was not until 1960s that Germany reckoned with the, the Holocaust. Uh, the Nuremberg trials did not do it. Even in the 1950s, majority of Germans still supported the, the Nazi final solutions, final solutions, sorry. It was the Frankfurt trials and it was 1968, the reckoning of the, the children who started asking their parents, where were you uh, in, in, when, when Holocaust was happening? So th this, I think, also, in a way, gives me hope that despite the fact that we managed to poison our young generation to the point where it's almost irreversible, that they will be starting to ask these questions when they uh, regain their individual sovereignty, if, if that happens. And I think another sign of hope, and I see questions here, there's, there's also a political movement and a political process to try to reverse some of these divisions, and we can talk about that, but. One of the significant facts to mention is the, the activists who are in the leadership are all under the age of 30. In other words, people who are not contaminated by the direct experience with the kind of um, adversarial conflict. Um, I apologize in advance if this is trite, but I'm thinking about the next generation here in St. Louis, the uh, young people who either don't remember or never were in Bosnia but are now here. And what is the message to their identity about pluralism that you would want them to have? I think I would have said something different. I, in my sense, that I know raising our kids teaching them the 
the uh, like you asked, what was the time? It was that we had a great time, so we are able to have a great time again. Teaching them that uh, regardless what happened, we have to understand what happened. We need to learn what happened. We have to process what happened, but we don't have to hate other people what happened. And people are able to live again together. We have proof from the history, and here you have it here. And 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 I, I have to tell you, when I was um, maybe ten years ago, I should I, because I did play basketball. Um, I was the show on Martin Luther King Day, and it was Bill Russell talking, and and uh, he said that when he was the best player in NBA in some states here in the United States, he did not go to the hotel to sleep, he has to sleep in the bus. And he could not go in every state in McDonald's. He had to ask his friend to buy for him his Bill Russell. So he was the best player in the NBA. So we have proof here uh, with uh, African people from Africa brought here to work for free. We have uh, proof uh, with Germany that happened, uh, that's what I'm saying, the Nürnberg process started, but process is still going on in Germany because people are asking what happened. So I believe in positive process because as, as again as a psychiatrist, a positive psychology is evidence. We have evidence on MRI of the brain show how positive thinking change neurons in the brain. We have proof for that. Many proofs in the last 10 years. So if we talk about po posit positively, if we talk about life together, we can change and help young generation to, to raise them in the peace and uh, to, to for good education, good life, and living with other people. We can do it because we have to change um, uh, our thinking and our uh, prospect on, on past. And I, I strongly believe in this, strongly. I would, I would like to, to in some level, support this, but in, from a different angle. I think that we really don't know what is going to happen to our children. I, mean, I have a 17, 16, 17-year-old daughter who is really growing up in a way that I, I cannot have a full grasp of. And in some ways, her identity is being negotiated in ways that I could have never imagined, you know, social network, global connections, ways that are far too scary for me to even think about. And some of the issues that, that I am um, still, in a way, obsessed with are, to her, so alien, because that discourse is very alien. Now, that said, I also know very young people who are completely turning uh, into very parochial and very self-defensive and xenophobic young people, even though they are growing up in a very pluralist society. So I think the, there is constant push and pull of, <coughs> of, you know, on the one hand, the walls breaking down, and the other hand, was going up. I mean, we now have more states in the world than we have ever had, and nations in the world than we have ever had, and self-determination is, is such a big word for so many minorities that have been deprived of nationhood and, and political uh, statehood and so on and so forth. So it really is um, a, a constant back and forth, and I think we just need to be extremely vigilant that we can't take for granted places like the United States or Canada because they too can be subject to extremely hard moments in which their sense of pluralism is going to be tested and has been tested. I mean, it has been tested in your country, it has been tested in, in, in Canada, in ways that in fact are not necessarily generationally divided, but are product of, of extremely um, um, large processes that, that I think we really don't, don't understand as it were. I, um, yeah, I agree there's no way of knowing, but there is also uh, the fact that um, what is interesting about this whole situation is not only what those kids can do for Bosnia, but what, can do, what, what they can do um, for the United States, if you wish. Um, because they are, um, it's not just Bosnian heritage in, those, in a cliche sense, but it's precisely that somewhere in their family, you know, their parents might be in this in this audience. Somewhere in their family, their past, all of these questions have come up. And um, of course, I don't think that you know the, all these polls about the, the uh, generation eighteen to twenty nine had entirely different thoughts about gay marriage and and, uh, and immigration and identity and, and equality and all that. 
and it could well be um, that you know uh, kids of, of, of complicated background, historical background, not just ethnic background, and there are more and more of them, and they're more and more um, they're more and more able to articulate their experiences, partly because they are capable of staying in touch with the with the homeland of their parents in various ways, whether the parents send them to for vacation, or they can watch the news on the internet, or listen to music, or they have cousins there. That um, that generation with immigrant or refugee background is uh, having more and more um, influence on what is going on in this country. And I can tell you this: that, that generation has to enter uh, American literature in a proper way. But even my generation of writers in American literature have changed the ways people think about what, what it means to be an American writer because they have brought, or we have brought in things that were not available before in previous generations. Dina, did you have a question? No. no. Um, this is on. Okay. Uh, I guess my question is, is not so much about my identity. I, I think I've come to grips with my identity as Bosnian American. Um, my question is, how do I use the opportunities that I have in America because I've grown up here and the experiences I've had going to Bosnia every summer and being able to tell you like where the good Chavapi are in Predor, um, you know, or Mostad even. Um, how do I use that and, and help Bosnia out? Because America, America will, will be fine either way, I think. Um, and <laughs> I, think, I think that the, what my, my problem is that inherently in the government and in certain uh, articles in the constitution of Bosnia, the, the Dayton agreements there, there's an inherent um, kind of boundary line between ethnicities. There's a certain number of seats that are reserved for certain ethnicities. And this force of multiculturalism or force of pluralism kind of it kind of hinders the fact it hinder, hinders the ability to grow into an actual multicultural society. Um, I think that uh, if you look at the Bosnian soccer team, it's very multi multi you know ethnic. You have Serbian, the Bosnian Serbs, Bosnian Croats, and Bosnians all playing together and playing rather well together um, because there's no defined guideline, but when, when we're introduced to this defined guideline um, by the Dayton Agreement or, or whatever it may be, how do, how do I, as a, as a young Bosnian American, how do I affect that? Is there any way I can change that or, or change that perception or, or even change it by law? I, I think you can, and, and I don't know all the ways because you're a young woman sitting there and have many years to figure out the ways. Um, but I, you know, um, the wars of the 90s were largely financed, supported, and imagined by the, the older immigration, right? The fascist immigration, post-World War II immigration, who were removed from the realities of, of uh, Tito's Yugoslavia, where people lived together, and therefore they were able to imagine ethnically pure states. And they spent 40, 50 years saving money in Canada or Australia, the United States, imagining their you know, Croatia, Serbia, or Kosovo even as, you know, devoid of all of those others. And once the, a chance was offered to them, they went back with all the money, Gorko Shusha being the Croatian Minister of Armament in, in the early 90s being the best example, spent 40 years in, in Canada selling pizzas. Um, and so to me, that the, the heartening thought is, and of course this is entirely utopian, but I'm prone to those utopias, is that there's a whole generation, generations indeed, of um, people um, like you, older and even younger, who will be able to be the positive immigration, who will be able and are able to imagine a Bosnia, a utopian project of a civic Bosnia, where it's not defined by ethnicities, where, you know, based on, on, not on pluralism, individual sovereignty, that this idea might well be more alive in this room than in many parts of Bosnia. And that one way or another, right, because it's an open world, because you probably remember a Facebook group you know, and there are members in Bosnia too, we can communicate with daily and not just to go to Prieta, that this idea can be transferred in, you know, in particularities, concrete, specific projects with specific people, but also in general. You know, everything beyond that is, is a question of specific organizations, specific operations, 
and, and a, a specific project. But it is this, you are the holder of this idea. It does not hurt that you are educated in the system which this idea is constantly you know, revised and discussed and it's well alive and, and the country with all its shortcomings is operating based on those ideas. So we, this is what we have here. This is what they, we have more here than they have there, far more. And we can you know, exchange things or change things, exchange ideas with them. First of all, I would like to thank you immensely for introducing football into this discussion. <laughs> <laughs> that is what we've been waiting for. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. To, to be able to discuss something positive. And, and, uh, <laughs> and, and to, uh, but football more than anything else. In terms of the success, it, it is about the success. And let's... let's uh, Let's discuss the football team for a second because it, it is even beginning to introduce these blasphemous notions of unifying the country through its success. Because if you have Ognjen Vranjes, who was born and raised in Baniluka during the war, who comes out and says, I'm a Bosnian, they wanted me to play for Serbia, but I wanted to play for Bosnia, and, and I'm proud to be play, playing for this team gives me more hope than anything to do with anything else. Uh, because it is the positive drive that will see us through. And in that, I have to say, you are my hope. Because uh, we have to, uh, we need you, we need people who, who have ideas, who have been taught differently, uh, who will come in and inject some of that positive drive. And in doing so, unfortunately, your question cannot be answered, but please do not be discouraged, because it is you uh, who is seen as a threat, first of all, by the establishment right now. So if you were to send an email to the Council of Ministers, mm -hmm. and like I have friends who have PhDs in various different uh, as we call them, deficit darning, uh, you know, different fields, who wanted to offer pro bono their services, they were never responded to. Why? Because they would be a threat if they would come in on the basis of their qualifications and knowledge to someone who was appointed by their uncle with no qualifications whatsoever. So you need to find a way to so you, you first of all have to be uh, aware that you will be fighting the establishment. You may be also fighting the resentment of your peers from Bosnia who will be saying, who the hell are you to come from you know, the United States where you were privileged while I had to live in this, excuse my language, <laughs> shithole. And, and now you come with all your fancy degrees and everything to take my job, my place. You will have to fight that too, with your positive idea of actually coming in to help and not being discouraged. And there are people there who will recognize that, I'm sure. And I definitely would like to encourage you to think in those terms and also to, um, at some level, uh, uh, say something positive uh, or recognize some positive uh, uh, movement in that direction because some years ago, and I witnessed this almost firsthand. I, I spent a year uh, of sabbatical in, in Bosnia doing my research about five six years ago, and um, a family that I uh, know that who moved to Australia and whose daughter was a very successful law graduate from um, from Sydney, and then moved on to the United States eventually wanted really to come to Syria and somehow give back something to, to Bosnia. But, so she asked me to whether I could help her find places where she, her, her diploma would be accredited. And she just could not even have her diploma recognized at, um, by, by the local institutions. They were, it was a combination of, of resentment, I think, that we are talking about here, but also this resistance to any form of 
novelty that would be brought in that would somehow change the dynamic that had been at some level established in these petty bureaucratic circles. And, um, and when she tried to, to complain, the woman behind the counter said to her, so, what a, what's a big deal? She says, we had even rejected the diploma from Harvard. <laughs> this was for her sense, yeah, what an so in other words, Gosh. look at us. What yeah. <laughs> and and then she just recently actually she told me that she finally got her diploma recognized about two years ago and that in fact all the diplomas that had been arriving from abroad had been not just recognized but also welcomed. So that there is some movement uh, in I think in a positive direction that definitely is I think to be uh, you know, to seize the opportunity to welcome people like like yourself, uh, I think that really is where, in the, you know, after all this talk about what might happen, that this is what matters. It matters that people like you are willing to give back something to Bosnia. So we transfer the burden to your shoulder. We transfer the burden. I've tried with my daughter, it doesn't work, so. Uh, you will regret asking this question. <laughs> <laughs> so who has the final question for this session? Hello. I was sort of wondering though, is that like in, Bo in like Bosnia before like the genocide happened, like during Yugoslavia, you had three different main groups, the Serbian Orthodox, uh, the Croatian Catholics, and the Bosnian Muslims. But during like Yugoslavia, yeah, like religion was suppressed and like people didn't take those identities as, as much in the personal life, beyond perhaps maybe having an Arabic first name or like a last name that might imply Muslim origin. Why would that be a factor determined to see them as others if like a majority of the Bosnians at the time, and even to some extent today, don't take a religion to as much of an extent in their own personal life. Okay, I can ask part of the question. Because the, the explaining the explaining the conflict, uh, it's it's uh, it's not it's not religious only. Religious was used for people to kind of get them get them into the war. Religious was misused. Religious was really every religious is nice. God is good, you know. God is good doing good things. It's not religious. What former Yugoslavia, religion was part of it, definitely. I'm not denying it. But former Yugoslavia was six independent states. From Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia, Montenegro, Macedonia, and Serbia. Six independent states and then uh, independent states and they made Federation of Yugoslavia and then in, in, in the 90s um, nationalism raising, Tito died and then Slovenia and Serbia are out because Serbia was dominating, that was obvious with money and everything else. Then Croatia get out in 91, in 92 Bosnia get out of this federation and then it was a fight, it was agreement between the president of Croatia Tijman and president of Serbia Milosevic, they, uh, they had final agreement in 1993 uh, to divide Bosnia because we are accidentally in the middle uh, between them. And they, they made a decision and they disagree on the city of uh, Stolac and the city of Mostar and that's why we continue to have this, this war. But so religious will just answer the question. There, there was people in Bosnia who are religious Muslim or Catholics or Orthodox, they did go to church or mass, but that again like here, I mean right now, the same story. It was not our major part of our identity. It was just part of our lives. And nobody like cares much unless you are in, like you said, in rural area or something. So, but before the war, like a couple of months before the war, that was rising, like religious thinking and uh, those priests on TV and stuff like that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Sorry, that, no problem. If I can just add briefly, I think basically uh, what, what, what you had in terms of uh, different religions being uh, a factor of identity in achieving the separation of people. But if you really take it uh, and, and analyze the discourse, especially the discourse in the media uh, and, and uh, different sort of forms of intelligentsia, academia, and, and uh, those uh, factors that shape opinion, you could see from 1986-87 uh, where uh, 
media under control of those who were intent on breaking Yugoslavia apart went to the past to find the sort of epicenters, the sore points of different uh, historical fights between the groups. So it was Kosovo battle that happened 600 years ago that had the Serbs and the Turks on the opposite sides. So you had the bones of the king of Serbia who fought valiantly against the Turks dug up and taken around Yugoslavia to basically bring people back to that discourse. And uh, when, when people, uh, for instance, when my uncle and my cousins were being taken to the camp in Priedor uh, uh, in 1992, and when they pleaded for their lives, uh, asking the neighbor who was taking them to the camp, well, why are you doing this? He said, this is for 1941. When in 1941, Serbs from the area were victims of the Ustasha regime, which was uh, populated mainly by Croats, but there were Muslims there as well. The fact was that neither my uncle, my cousins, nor him were born in 1941. <laughs> So these, these sort of major uh, earthquakes between different groups were used to be applied in terms of ethnic separation, and that is where religion came as, as a factor. Yeah, but I would, say, I would say that it has then transformed into something else, and that today it is a factor of separation in the way that it was not before the war. Can I, can I add a little bit to this? Because I, I somehow sense that there is a historical question in this as well, and, and so I'd like to chip in into conversation. Um, if, if I uh, understand you correctly, you're really also asking how, how come this happened? How come these kinds of categories were formed and they seem to be clearly, so clearly defined? Um, you know, Bosnia, the, the, the Balkans, when they were under the Ottoman Empire, in the pre, you know, pre-national time, pre-time of before the, the, the national uprisings of the 19th century, they were organized by religion. So people were, you know, Catholic, Orthodox, Muslim, Jewish, and so on and so forth. The Ottomans didn't care so much about ethnicities, about cultures, they cared about religions. And that's how they grew the population. So for the longest time, people internalized this. This, this was the way in which their line of separation was was presented to them. In 19th century, when religion was no longer really the interesting category, but, it, but ethnicity took over as a term, the religion was really just translated into the ethnicity. So you have, you know, the orthodoxy being associated with, with serfdom, uh, Catholicism with, with Croat identity, and Muslims did not really have the, the identical ethnic uh, um, uh, term, corresponding term, and remain Muslim. Now it's called Bosnia, but really remain Muslim. So, but in, in more ethnic terms rather than in religious terms. So, at some level, you know, I, I've always wondered how the journalists, when the war began, did not see any problem with saying, uh, you know, the groups in in, in um, the fighting parties in Bosnia are Serb, Croat, and Muslim. That they didn't see how, in fact, those three categories don't match. That one is a religious category, the other two were the ethnic categories. But that's in fact was because the, that, that kind of language of separation had been internalized in the regions for so long that it just stayed, it, it, it stayed on. And it didn't necessarily mean that these were, uh, as everybody else has said, I mean, they, they, they had any more meaning than, than, the, than what the label uh, betrayed. But, but in fact, they do have strong religious grounding, except that that grounding got diluted through the language of, of secular uh, political self-determination, ethnicity, and so on and so forth. I think, <clears throat> um, in my understanding, in a stable uh, functioning society that you know uh, um, guarantees a certain individual in pursuit of happiness and development, all this people, their people, um, the development of human beings could be described as an acquisition of identities. <laughs> So that as you grow older and, and expand your human experience and connect with other people, or even a complicated society, you become more complex as a human being and acquire identities. 
it's a violation and violence against a violation of and violence against a, um, an individual human being to reduce that human being to one identity. This is what racism is. This is what the Nazis did in, in Germany. This is what was happening in the South in the 50s here. And this is what is, you know, in situations of segregation, but this is what's happening. The people are stripped of everything that constitutes them except one thing. And the one thing is what they cannot choose, because you cannot choose um, your ethnicity or you're born into it, right? However complicated and simple it is. <clears throat> so to once the societal infrastructure broke down, people lost their other identities. For one thing, if they didn't have a job, they had lost their professional identity, and so on. But it's also wrong, I think, to understand the conflicts and wars of former Yugoslavia only in terms of unresolved ethnic and religious questions. I worked as a journalist in the late 80s and early 90s. I remember that the pro proposal for the budget for Yugoslav People's <laughs> Army in 91 they requested 61% of the national budget in the country that had no money at all. 61%. You know, this country has, what, 4%? And it's enormous. 61% means that we, you know, we would have to work for them. What the case was that, that the army of one of the biggest in Europe had enormous amount of arms, and suddenly they had no jobs and no money to be paid for. You know, there's a sociological aspect to the whole war, in other words. Suddenly they have a large number of men with arms and nothing to do, right? That's not a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> we have Idaho and Montana here. <laughs> but imagine, you know, hundreds of thousands of people with arms and nothing to do. And then here comes Milosevic who says, well, I'll print money for you, and then you can take half of Bosnia back to Belgrade, and, you know, we, we're in business. So there was, for this to work, they had to, part of this project was propaganda and building up of the otherness, but otherness that is simplified and reduced. Everyone is another to me if I have a complicated, human identity, right? Because there's no one with this particular combination of, of attributes, right? But I don't see it as, as in, uh, uh, something dangerous, something that is what violates me, right? Because I assume that everyone is like that. Everyone is complicated. But if I can be reduced to one thing, or I can, if I can reduce someone else to one thing, then I can reduce myself to one thing. And then the only way we can resolve our conflict is by violence, because there's nothing else left. There's no ground for negotiation, as it were. I think we're off to a really great start in terms of what I know will be continuing conversations like this all weekend. I'd like to thank and acknowledge our presenters with a round of applause. And then I want to invite you to uh, join us one level up where we have Bosnian food and desserts and refreshments. And either before or after the